Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode number 15. Diagio, is it worth buying? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DGI. This is a podcast where we discuss our passion for dividend growth investing with our own unique European flavor. If you're new to the channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us, and check out our previous episodes in YouTube and Spotify and all your other favorite platforms. See you on the inside. Hey, what's up, EDJ? How's it going? I'm doing pretty well. I had a busy week again, like last week, so uh, we can, I guess, uh, plug that in as a repeating message. Yeah, doing pretty well. How about you? Yeah, same as. Uh, busy as, as, as you know it works, so I'm, I'm expecting a quieter week next week, which I'm quite looking forward to, a, a well-deserved break, so kind of looking forward to that. Lucky you. Yeah, when I say quieter, I'm st- still be busy, but it won't be. I won't be in work till eight, nine o'clock in the evening. So that's a plus plus side for me. Getting home at five o'clock will be a luxury next week. Mm. Nice. Well, you deserved it. So, and uh, I hope you get some uh, inspirational time then to create some interesting stock analysis, as an example, in your blog post. Yeah, I'm hoping to get back to to some of that. I've I've kind of stacked off in the last couple of weeks, so I'm hoping to to do that. I, I was actually going to do. The Azure next, but we're covering it now, so I don't need to do that. But I'll pick somebody. I don't know. I don't know who yet. Maybe, maybe Microsoft. I oh, know you've done that. So maybe Johnson Johnson or someone that's in my top tier companies. Maybe. Cool, cool, cool. So tell me, what what did you notice in the news this week? There was there was two pieces that kind of stuck out for me. Um, one of them was because of last week's question about investment trusts. It just popped up on my feed that there is a new one coming out soon, uh, Buffettology Smaller Companies Investment Trust. So they actually intend to use Warren Buffett's principles in, in investing in small caps in, in the UK. And they're looking to, to raise a minimum of 100, 100 million pounds, which is $127 million uh, via IPO. So that's, that's interesting. I'm going to watch them. I'm not getting involved, but just just to watch them and, and see how they do will be will be interesting. And then the second piece was from, I was watching Dirty Money. I think I spoke to you about this before. So I've, I've started to watch this. I'm, I'm so behind. So I, I've watched episode one there last week about the Volkswagen, the diesel gate emissions. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting on, on my feed today, I saw that they are now bringing the chief officer at the time, Martin, Wintercorn, I think, um, he's going to be tried now, so he's going to going to suffer heavy consequences, I believe, for his his actions in it. I don't want to ruin the episode if anyone hasn't watched it, but it's definitely worth definitely worth watching. So it's more like a lock him up. Uh, I mean, I mean, thing. I mean, it's good, isn't it? Because uh, you have to suffer consequences. Like th- so many people yeah. have suffered from this, so I mean, I think justice should be done, and and maybe as a warning to other. CEOs in similar positions that you just mm-hmm. can't hoodwink people yeah. for that amount of time and, and, and get away with it. Yeah. I believe you have some some more lighthearted and entertaining news. Well, uh, let's start with the first one. It caught my attention that Deutsche Bank is closing 100 out of the 500 banks. So I think, um, I don't know what's happening with Deutsche Bank, but they go from scandal to scandal to scandal, now closing banks. I'm just wondering who will once pull the plug from this bank and just like, you know, package it, ship it to the moon and get rid of it because it adds no value anymore to society. It only uh, creates negative energy. I don't know why we still have this bank. I feel sorry for all the people that work there, but uh, yeah gone anyway 100 banks again closing 
Um, yeah, and it's also probably the, the impact of fintech, right? Uh, you don't need anymore to go to a physical bank store for doing your business. So it's kind of, for me, it's a little bit ref referring to the old economy, like how it was like 20 years ago before the mobile phones and everything. And um, yeah, but, you know, let's go to lighthearted <laughs> news. Um, this was really funny. So there was a person in Aberhausen in, in the UK that uh, effectively was the root cause <laughs> of everyone in the village every morning at 7 a.m. having no internet anymore. So what happened? Some literally some engineers were were walking through the <laughs> through the streets with a spectrum analyzer to try and find any electrical noise. Remember, this took eighteen months to find the problem, and then the reason was that the householder would just switch on the TV, TV set every morning at seven a.m. and it was like. Um, a second-hand television that was just affecting the whole village with their broadband signal. I found this brilliant. I mean, it's I mean, 2020. Yeah. I mean, you say that to me, and we were both laughing and joking. But I don't even know how that's possible. I don't know how an old TV set can take down a whole village, but that's that's brilliant. And and the engineers, 18 months. That's 80 months of free money being paid to walk around yeah. looking for a signal. It's a brilliant story. I, these are the AT and Ts of this world, right? That's the crap we get in the villages. <laughs> <laughs> That's for That's how they pay our dividends. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so I found it really funny, and um, but uh, let's go to the main topic uh, for today, Derek. How about um, doing some stock analysis this time? It's the first time we will do that in our show. Yeah, I'm excited. Looking forward to this one. So our stock that we decided to analyze today is Diageo, if I pronounce it well. We don't know who pronounces it right, so feel free to correct us. I say Diageo. Diageo. So um, as you're also a little bit from overseas uh, and you know the brand probably there for a little bit, uh, it's probably closer to your heart. Can you explain a little bit about how the company earns its money? Yeah, it's quite simple. They sell booze and lots and lots of booze um i suppose that anybody from from ireland will instantly recognize some of the brands that they own guinness captain morgan smirnoff baileys and johnny walkers those five brands alone in ireland and the uk would be would be well known and and even throughout the, the whole world so i think they have six six main brands in their i think they call them the global joints the only one that that i missed there was i think it's tank Tankery, I believe they're called. Um, I haven't heard of that one before, but the, the, their business is built around those six six, band, six brands. So they're the main, and I think they make up 39% of their sales overall. Then they've mm -hmm. got a second second kind of tier underneath, which they call local stars. Um, so these can be individual to a market, or they can provide a platform for their business to grow. So some of the brands that are there are black and white labeled uh, Windsor. There's also Old Power, and then there's a, a couple others that I just I don't know, but they're probably, as I said, local. And then the final tier, which is the reserve tier. So again, these are exceptional spirit brands, they call them, at premium prices that they capture the global luxury opportunity. So you're looking at the likes of uh, trying to see if any of them stick out to me, uh, Don Julio and Blue Label, for example. I, I'm not too, I'm not too familiar with the rest of them, but the the premium brands. But that makes up the bulk. But that makes up uh, 21 percent of of their sales. So they have kind of three three tiers. Obviously, they are premium. Six brands make up the bulk of it, and then they have lots and lots of other brands. Then in the other two tiers, um, geographically, then. They're pretty much everywhere. Um, the North America, I suppose, be one of their biggest markets with nearly forty percent. I was quite surprised with that. Actually, I thought maybe Europe might be a little bit bigger, but Europe comes in next with Turkey at twenty-one percent. Africa, quite surprisingly, was up at eleven percent. Um, Asia, nearly twenty percent, and then you've got Latin America and the Caribbean then at, at nearly eight percent. So, the, the, the hugely diversified across the whole globe, essentially. 
um, and they have got big brands, I suppose, that that everyone everyone recognizes. So, uh, look, it's it's easy to describe what the business does. They sell alcohol, lots of it, all over mm-hmm. the world. Yeah, and I noticed that they have really high uh, gross margins, like sixty percent. It almost looks like a, a cloud business. Uh, okay, they go maybe to eighty or ninety percent gross margin, but sixty percent gross margin is is a pretty healthy business, I would say. Uh, if you can make so much profit on uh, on I mean, your product, yeah, I mean, for for something that's widely used, it's 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 like coffee, isn't it? it mm-hmm. Huge margins, and and I suppose everybody, yeah. everybody I know at least has one or two drinks i mean yeah. a week or one so everybody does have alcohol it's a premium premium band so yeah but, and that shows also the company i mean when you see such margins right on such consumer products you just know that they have pricing power that these are really strong brands because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get such margins so from that point of view that that sounds actually quite promising yeah, I, I mean, one t- one thing you would know with with Diageo is is that it's like Coca Cola, like it's just a strong, strong brand, super strong brand. Mm-hmm. It's it's key to them because it would be hard for a competitor to come in and, and break through. I think in in mm-hmm. this in that particular, particularly with their premium brands, they're so well known and so widely used. It would be hard for someone to come in and kind of knock them off where they are at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, thank you, EMF. So let's look a little bit then at their uh, at the hard numbers there. So what I'm observing is that um, so actually maybe good for the listeners. They released their annual report um, uh, after quarter two, right? So it was like I think released in July, early July. Q three numbers are not out yet but those will be the q1 numbers for them so we don't have those numbers yet so we depend this on the uh, july numbers and their uh, net sales went down from 12.8 billion i believe to to 11.7 billion so literally 1 billion down and it's probably good to mention that this is uh, as what we saw in the annual report is uh, almost only due to COVID 19. so they lost a billion of sales due to COVID 19 and mainly in the second part of the year and I, I believe they report twice a year so we don't have the quarterly data we just have the let's say the half year data and that's where you could really see the decline in uh, in sales um and what's then interesting it's also um uh, highlighted by um, their their uh, i said uh, Catherine Mickles their chief financial officer uh, officer and she says it literally so she says in the annual report organic net sales were down 8.4 percent for the full year driven by volume declines on the back of the recent and sudden contraction of the total beverage alcohol industry driven by the reduction of out-of-home consumption consumption occasions so it's really what they sell in the bars restaurants um, airports so it's it's the perfect uh, how you say it uh, the COVID-19 beer 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 play yeah yeah and, and and we can also see that profits fell massively as well during that time nearly 50 percent um was it to 2.1 billion and like we were having a look before and then and the management wrote off some some assets in india and korea and ethiopia of about 1.3 billion so we we can see COVID 19 had a massive massive impact on 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 the azure and and the uncertainty at the moment is one thing that concerns me with this is we're starting to open back up but we're talking about locking stuff back down and it's probably happening all over the world so how long this goes on for will, will deeply impact the azure so yeah. it's, it's it's worth keeping an eye on and see how they actually adapt to to this market and i'm looking forward to actually their, their next quarterly earnings because that might tell us yeah. a little bit more than what we're seeing at the minute yeah so i was a bit surprised actually still about their uh, impairments that they listed so uh, like you just mentioned in, in the in the council like india and kenya but you know six and a half uh, 655 million impairment due to a regulatory change in india uh, for which they then had to reduce their um, how is it future cash flow predictions it's a lot of money on top of that the uh, uh, more than 400 million impairment on the Windsor Premier brand, um, uh, uh, also in, in Korea. It's it's really a lot of money. So it's not it's COVID 19, but on top of that, this this more than a one billion impairment as well. A little bit also due to COVID 19, 
but it was really a kitchen sink, uh, let's say, quarter or year for them uh, in the last report. So I hope that it also stays like that, that they now impaired all, all that they had to impair because the numbers really looked ugly um, when we look at the second half of the year. And maybe that was a bit strategic to to make those impairments at this time because uh, yeah. you can easily pass that off as as just COVID-19 and you could, I mean, we had to dig deep yeah. to find them. So it would be something that if you're glossing over the report, you may have missed um, and you would just put the sales and revenue down yeah. to just COVID-19. But maybe it was a, a good management to, to put that in at this moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely something to, to keep an eye on. Yeah, all oh, there was no, no, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, and then, so if we then also, and maybe it's good to mention also about like, is the, how, how does the dividend look like, right? So, the dividend currently, if we look at um, the EPS payout, let's say, it's not, not covered. If we take the, uh, uh, I said, what is the IFRS, I believe, numbers? Um, based on EPS, uh, maybe on the adjusted numbers, but I typically don't look really at it. And then if we look at the free cash flow, it's 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 hundred point seven percent. So effectively, all the free cash flow is consumed at the moment by the, the dividend, which you could argue is not too bad. If this is the deep in the, the depth of their uh, of the crisis, then they they just still covered the dividend. But again, this was just from the second part of their earnings uh, for the full year. So. If this continues, like you said, probably the dividend might not be covered at all, and they would really need to eat up their balance sheet to uh, uh, keep paying it out. On, on, on the flip side to that, and as I said, we did come across the, the 100%. I did look back over the previous 10, 10 years, went through all the mm. annual reports, and the free cash flow was, it was well covered. So typically, you're looking, I think, up around 60% was max, maybe 65, 67%. So between 50 to 60% or 60 to 70. So it's always been well covered over the last couple of years. So I'm not too concerned at the moment. I mean, we know we know COVID had, had a massive impact on it. So I believe that they, if, if they come out of this, they might go back down to those levels. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not too concerned about those figures right now. But it, it's certainly a red flag to to say, okay, is this the new norm? Will this will this be that the, yeah. the cash flow going forward? It's it's just a red flag, but I'm not I'm not really concerned about it at the moment. Mm. But that's maybe good then also to look at the balance sheet, right? Because uh, the balance sheet will give a little bit uh, the sign of how strong how strong they are to weather the storm. And what we noticed is that they have been um, leveraging up. They increased their debt almost with 40%. So I believe they added around 4 billion of debt over the last uh, year. Uh, I believe it was around 10.5 billion based on 2019 numbers, now 14.7. Uh, some of that debt has been used for share buybacks, still in the good times, in the end of uh, uh, Q3 and Q4 in 2019. But what we also saw is that they just issued for two billions of bonds to increase liquidity during this crisis. So uh, this means also that the interest coverage ratio went went quite um, um, doesn't just doesn't look well. But you know, if if you remember what what, what does the interest coverage make up? Um, so effectively saying how how easy can you pay your debt from the profits? So that's looking at EBIT. EBIT is really low at the moment. And debt is forty percent higher, so that's why these numbers look really ugly. These numbers would look better again if the if the earnings, just in general, uh, recover. But the debt is there to stay. What we have seen is that most of the debt went went indeed to the cash balance, to the cash and, and cash equivalents. So it is indeed not not you know burned up uh, straight away. It's still on the balance sheet. Um, but in, you know they need to start paying interest now. Luckily, it's a low interest environment. But what we also notice is that uh, the debt in total, all the liabilities, make up seventy percent of their whole balance sheet. So it's a highly leveraged company. And for me, that's um, maybe not a red flag in this case, but an orange flag. I and mean, if it becomes a high interest rate environment again, I think we will see a lot of um, decline in, in in growth numbers in, in in this company when it comes to dividend growth and such uh, free cash flow because they will lose a lot of money on then on 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 their debt so this is something to be aware of that we are now in a low interest rate environment 
and it already doesn't look too well yeah and, and look they've, they've taken some steps that they, they released um, a statement back in february or march maybe mm -hmm. um, about buybacks so they, they've paused the buybacks for now so they, they, they've stopped that and as you said we, we are in a low interest environment so if we are to increase that interest the dividend safety will really come into question there i, yeah. I believe so it, it's we did talk talk about the, the free cash flow and yes we're kind of confident that if they get back to to the other levels but we do have to realize we are in a low interest environment and, and companies that are highly leveraged will come under massive amounts of pressure once those yeah. interest rates rise so for me that 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 is a, that is another warning sign for me to be honest yeah so maybe we should look at the dividend then so they paid 70 70 pence i believe uh, zero yep. seven pound uh, if it's if i talk in the english way right it's, it's 70 pence <laughs> Exactly, at a share price of uh, around 25 pounds. So that gives us a yield of around 2.8% at the moment. I checked a little bit the dividend growth history because it's also uh, a Noble 30 member. And the last 10 years it grew, it's dividend by an average of 5.65%. In the decade from 2000 to 2010, it was 5.5%. So it's kind of a steady average. The, la the last five years, however, it was 3.4% in, in, in average growth over the whole annualized growth. And the last year, it just grew 2.3%. So the dividend growth is declining as well. And, you know, if you just heard what we spoke about regarding the balance sheet and such and the cash flow, then it makes sense. Because also over time, it's not like the earnings have been on fire or something like that, right? So also um, uh, from that point of view, um, it, 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 yeah, it, it, there are some again some orange flags here uh, warning signs that the dividend might not grow at the same rate as it was growing in the last 20 years yeah and and, and i suppose the dividend yield at the minute is as you said 2.7 which is around average from historically point of view looking back looking back over the last 10 10 years and it's been hovering between 2.4 up the three just over three percent so from a yield perspective it's it's where it's normally been but but it's that growth that dividend growth is is not where i'd like it to be certainly two yeah. percent is, is very low so uh, again that would be something for me that i would it's kind of negative negative for me so a lot a lot of red flags at, at the moment yeah. But honestly, if I see if if I see these numbers, I would have expected a dividend yield around maybe four and a half, five percent. Yeah, but you know what I mean, for all the risks that we have seen so far already, I would have not expected uh, um, a dividend yield, which is actually at the moment compared to Johnson Johnson. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was looking at the dividend yield back in two thousand and ten. It was three dot two two, which is higher than what it is now, and. We have more risk now than in 2010 yeah. when they were coming out of, of it. So yeah, exactly. I would, I would definitely want to see that at least 4.5 before I'd even look at it. I suppose. Yeah. And and how about the, the future? Then looking to the future, is is there anything in the future that that you would? Well, think? I think we were we were considering a bit like the the how you said the Asian market, China and India. Mm. I think it's for many, many companies generally a growth, um, how is it, uh, or envisioned as a catalyst, the globalization here. I wouldn't know elsewhere as well. Uh, maybe they could do something in direct con to consumer, but, you know, alcohol via the meal, I don't know if that's always the best idea. Um, but what I would like to say is like, here I would really take also a little bit like, for instance, um, if companies talk about in the alcohol business about increasing sales in China and India, I would just like to remind all the listeners that India is a highly Muslim country. So to, you know, you need to come, you need to do some pretty well, uh, how is it, speaking almost like a, like a priest uh, to convince people to really start, start getting drunk and drink a lot of alcohol, maybe like the English do so that that uh, i don't see that happening so quick but hey li like we made a joke before the before the show if just one on hundred thousand people in india drink alcohol now and they go to two out of hundred thousand they double their sales there yeah, so. i i would imagine of the two china would be the key market for them there yeah uh, you mentioned you mentioned religion with india but in china that that barrier would not be there i wouldn't imagine so yeah. 
I think I think that's probably where where the focus is, and and to be honest, to many people, there's over one billion people there, so that uh, there there is definitely a market, and as they go up to middle class and and the value chain moves, Diago will be there with their premium brands and obviously sixty yeah. percent margins. There's there's a lot of a lot of cash to be made there. Yeah. So let's uh, then plug quickly in the numbers for the valuation. And um, we did both the div dividend discount model and the discounted cash flow. Let's start with the dividend discount model. We used the discount rate of 8.7%. Uh, we grabbed it from uh, stockanalysis.net. Um, we'll put the link in the description of the video. And we assumed a dividend growth rate at 5.5%. .5%. So this is at the 10 year average, but we, Please, disclaimer, we just mentioned that the dividend growth rate was in decline. But if we would take this dividend growth rate of 5.5%, .5%, it comes to a fair value of approximately 21.5 pounds. So this means that the company is definitely 15%, approximately 20% overvalued, just based on this. And we are already using an optimistic figure. So, And this comes again a little bit to our narrative that we had before. If we take the discounted cash flow model, it just looks really bad because um, I'm using a terminal growth rate of two percent there. I usually use it around inflation. So, and what what is what? How does it impact? Just that the net present value of the future cash flows is is not not too high. But the issue here is like literally the the depth. If you deduct the depth from the enterprise value. You just don't have a lot left. So we came to a disc, uh, I was hitting fair value estimate of eight or seven uh, pounds. I think um, that's also not reflective. From the other side, if we just spoke about the yield of four to five percent, you know, it would mean a price around 12 pounds. So having said that, I'm not looking too much at this number, but it's again a red flag to me that the depth has a high impact on this. And I'm not going to. I, I said fiddle with the terminal growth rate and make it five or six percent uh, just to make the numbers look nicer and closer to the current price. So, yeah, that, that's it from a fair value. So, 20 and a half pounds, let's say, and then on the, on the DDM and on the DCF, nine pounds approximately. It just gives you a little bit of a range where the fair value probably somewhere lies. So, you could even say, okay, maybe somewhere in the middle around 15, 16 pounds. But in that case, it would mean that the current stock price is heavily overvalued um, yeah. already. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth mentioning that that we got the terminal growth rate from the annual report. So that was from their estimations mm -hmm. of 2%, of which we, we actually still think is a little bit too high. Um, as we mentioned, it should be around inflation. So just to be aware, um, or just to point out, that's that's where we got yeah. it from. Um, yeah. So on to the recommendation. I don't think this will be any surprise, but I'll ask you first. Well, if I would have it, I would I would even probably consider uh, selling it, you know. So when I when I see this, I don't see why I should own Diago when I can get Johnson and Johnson instead. So I would probably I would actually probably sell it. Yeah. yeah, and just as you said that, I had a quick look on TradingView and all the technical um, indicators are saying strong sell, which is which is saying something, but. I mean, for me, recommendation. I would not. I would not be buying right now. Um, mm -hmm. like, like you, if I did own it, there is a case to to sell. Um, I I don't know if I would sell. I, I might just hold, but I I certainly wouldn't be buying or adding adding to that position yet. Yeah, yeah, it's true, and it's good to just mention that because usually I don't sell companies once I own them. So there's this uh, part of it. So if if you would ask me. If I would really have it in my portfolio, I would probably definitely stop adding. But now that you say it, I don't know if I would sell it just because I have this kind of buy and hold approach to companies. And if I would go through my whole portfolio, probably I would need to sell ExxonMobil straight away now as an example. So yeah, it's still, it would be in the sales, sell side for me. Yeah. Cool. That was uh, quite interesting to do. I enjoyed it. Um, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. If if you enjoyed this kind of thing, we, we can certainly do more, maybe do one or two within the show. But I, I certainly enjoy going through the annual reports with you and, and digging in and finding some of these nuggets of information that maybe I would have missed before. So 
thank you for that yeah likewise um likewise it's fun to do it together and also a second pair of eyes really builds my own confidence as well so thanks for that emf cool so nice and short um but we have lots and lots and lots of listeners questions this week so we, we have plenty of time to to answer all those questions so i might just start and ask you the first one so it came from dividend wave and he said i don't remember if you discussed it before but do you guys own crypto and if yes where do you hold it no i don't own crypto just because i don't understand it and that's a simple reason i've been looking sometimes into bitcoin but then if i then had to at the time go to to some shady app that uh, allows me to buy crypto then i already stay away from it and i don't need to, to have it on my laptop either and uh, do the mining so i just stayed away from it and that's why i don't have it yeah i, I do hold some some bitcoin at the moment i use um bitstamp the european european companies that's what, where i hold my bitcoin i used to be a little bit more in it so i used to trade on binance um, i had all sorts of coins i had xrp t uh, trx all, all the usual ones but i suppose it was like a, a bull market in 2017 when everything was going up it was easy i was i was quite lucky um i got out early i got out just before the crash happened so i, I made a nice few bob from it but i suppose like you I didn't really understand. I, I, I did understand bits, but there was projects there and, and they just seemed worthless and there was millions and millions being pumped into them. So it's just too dodgy. So I do hold a little bit of Bitcoin and a small bit of Ethereum. Um, I'm bullish on Ethereum going forward, but I, I've, I've kind of lost pace and, and not kind of kept track of what's going on in that world anymore. So it's just kind of buy and hold and hopefully it reaches, I think John McAfee said it's going to reach 1 million. So if one Bitcoin reaches that, I can retire early. Wow. Maybe I should buy some. <laughs> I, 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 don't even know, I don't even know what price it's at now. It was hovering around nine or 10,000. So yeah. I wouldn't be buying now. I didn't buy at those levels. Trust me. <laughs> cool. Next question then. Dividend talk. And this one for you maybe. What is more important in your portfolio picks? Absolute dividend or dividend growth? I mean, if you had gone to my head and, and I had to choose one of the two, it would be probably dividend growth. But I think you need a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. But uh, but dividend growth for me is is probably the most most and more important out, out of the two of those. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you both. And I was also thinking like, at what stage? Because you know, if you have some absolute dividend in the beginning, it might help a little bit more stimulating the compounding effect. Maybe not in the first year, but in year three, four, five, you benefit a little bit from that, from your having a higher average yield in your portfolio. So it's it's a it's a it's a mix. But if I really had to choose with a gun on my head, I would probably also do dividend growth. Actually, I, I just remember that dividend wave the who asked the last question, he has some nice charts or one side as that he's put on Twitter, I believe, and he shows the difference in you know, uh, absolute dividend and dividend growth and how they actually intertwine and at what mm -hmm. point they cross over. It's quite interesting. So I'm sure he'll share it again. I've seen it a number of times because people keep reference to it, but it's it's a good slide to, to dig out. Okay, uh, question number three. So this one's from Phil, our guest last week. And he sent this one in quite late, but we'll we'll forgive him. Um, he said, if not too late, do you talk with your partners or spouses about investing and how do you involve them? Only for brainstorming or also actively as a vote in your decision? So it, it really depends on how I should treat this question. Because if you say, do you talk with... No. Do you talk to? Yes. <laughs> it's 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 a one-way conversation. My wife has totally no interest in this. She 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 trusts me in this. It's for her a bit blah blah blah. And it's about numbers and such, so she's already disconnected. She loves that maybe in let's say a decade from now she doesn't need to work anymore. So she's totally bought in with the philosophy. 
but I'm rather talking to her maybe once a month, just giving her a heads up whether it's going well or not, rather than talking with because, uh, yeah. But how about you? <laughs> yeah, exact, exact same. My wife trusts me with it. It's like talking to, so I, I do speak to her about it, but. I mean, she's it just goes overhead, and she says that's that's numbers. I actually have better conversations with my son, my ten year old son. Me too. It. And he he asked me for a book, so I bought him a book on Amazon dividend growth investing. Um, I don't think I have it here. I must get the order. And he read it in one day. No, it, it was wow. it was it was about fifty pages, but he he read it in one day, and I was like, no way did he read that in one day. So I was quizzing him, asking him questions. And he could answer every single one. So we did actually read it, and he, wow. he's, he's quite interested and he's asking questions. So we're even sitting down. I have a I have a list here. I got him to write down stuff, and he's writing down stocks that he likes, and we're just going to talk through him. That's just so cool. Billy, Billy's interest. So maybe not my wife, but my my ten year old son. We we I'm, I may be taking decisions from him pretty soon. It's quite a smart kid. It's fun that you say that. So my son is two years younger than yours. And this this week he was saying that he wants to go to Harvard. And he asked me how much it costs. I said, oh, at least 100,000. He said, so how can I get 100,000? He said, well, you need to start investing. So he started pushing me to start investing now. I said, oh, yeah, we can start, but uh, with your pocket money. And then he started crying because it meant that he would never go to Harvard then. So I promised him that uh, we would... Uh, uh start investing so that he can go to harvard when he's old enough awesome uh, hey, and if you have a goal at least you have something to stick by so that that might push him that that's awesome yeah hey, you you probably need to double up your dividends to to get him through harvard though yeah yeah true but maybe they have like an online class via udemy uh, by that time <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next one is from uh, Centrino. It's, uh, it sounds a little bit from Intel Centrino. Those were those uh, CPUs from the past. Um, in the shaky days, and some people predicting a new crash, would you recommend to invest a big amount on a red day or keep investing smaller amounts every month, week? I, I read an article from the Dividend Guy, Mike over in the Dividend Guy, this week. It was on Seek and Alpha. And I commented to him that it was very brave. So it was in 2017 and reading through his article, everybody was predicting the crash in 2017. Everybody was predicting the crash in 2018. Here we are with COVID and people are still predicting crashes. But I suppose the point was back then he invested, I think it was like 100,000 or a large amount of money in a time that was uncertain. There was a huge bull market and it's worked out pretty well. I said to him, it's pretty brave. Everybody would say they do it. But not everybody would do that, I don't believe. So to answer the question, you can never predict the crash. I would just stick to your plan. If you have a plan, if it's to invest all your money right now, stick to that plan. If it's to invest monthly, weekly, or whatever it is, I would just stick to it. And if there's a crash happen, great. But if not, just just keep keep chugging along. Cool. For me, the same. Stick to the plan. Cool. Uh, the next question was from the Wolf of Harcourt Street. He said, as a European investor investing in US stocks, do you consider the FX movement in your portfolio? And have you any strategies to mitigate it? I think we spoke about this a little bit before when we were talking about portfolio allocation kind of topics. So as a European investor in investing in US stocks and in European stocks, I don't need to worry so much about the currency fluctuations. Yes, and uh, I have thought a lot about this specifically when I started investing. And I can imagine that actually most of the people that start investing in dividend growth investing come up with these questions because they see that the lar largest part of the portfolio are in US stocks. I switched from almost an 80-90% dominated portfolio in US stocks over the last two years into, I think I've now still 55-58% in US stocks. So for me, the currency fluctuations are already less of an issue. I know also that the dollar went from, what is it, 1.7 to 1.18, 1.20. But I also enjoyed the ride from 1.50 to 1.7 yeah, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. 
So, you know, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. I need my money in uh, 10 years from now, let's say. So we'll see then where the US dollar is. I, I rather diversify in geographical areas than betting on one currency. Yeah, you're right. We, we have spoke about this before. And I think I've mentioned it's not something that I've I've looked at now. I'm sure I will when it comes to me needing the money. It might be more important, but, but right now, I, I haven't looked at it, but it, it makes sense. These questions are being asked because, like you said, the the dollar has been fluctuating quite a bit, and it can be quite disconcerting for new investors looking at their portfolio and seeing, okay, the share price is up, but my money is down, and how is that possible? And, and it's due to the currency. So I just stick with it for now. I, I invest, as I said, monthly. So kind of just trying to even out those peaks and troughs, and mm -hmm. and yeah. maybe worry about it in the future. Okay. Cool. Bullish beer. Next question. What do you think about the tobacco companies in the long run? Are they the new Kodaks? Like Altria is very tempting at the moment, but it, it's like investing in lung cancer. Yeah, we're back to ethics here again, aren't we? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a tough one. Altria at the moment has a super high dividend. I think it's pushed past 8% right now. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how, how they sustain and, and I suppose the next lot of financial reports will be will tell us a lot about where they are. I have no problem about tobacco companies. I know most of them are trying to diversify into other areas and and, and grow their companies. You you wrote an article on, on Bats British Tobacco, a uh, British American tobacco company. And and you really like the company. So I don't see a huge issue now. I don't see a huge issue in the next five years maybe longer term maybe but we can see these companies transitioning so it's about how they transition now and how they pivot and and, and how that how that fares out but at, at this moment in time i'm not overly worried about tobacco companies and i have, I have no problem i'm not an ethical investor i i, I put my hands up and i'm not I, I let my money invest in do the talking for me so to speak um but I do know there's there's plenty of others out there, especially generation coming up after that are, are more ethical. So that might have a bigger impact in the future. So the, the only thing that I um, would challenge a little bit is about Kodak. So Kodak doesn't exist anymore because they stopped reinventing themselves. Yeah, They, they didn't went on the hype of the digital camera. They just lost. That's why they went down. And if I now look at the tobacco companies, they're all into vaping and everything. So they're quite innovative yeah, in, in this space. Um, at the same time, prices are really down because also no, there are not many pension funds that still want tobacco companies for their clients in their portfolios. It's the same a little bit with oil companies. So those are indeed the sin stocks at the moment. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put Kodak in the same row because I think some of the companies are highly innovative it's rather indeed to his point do you want to invest in it ethically my point is that no almost no company in the s p 500 can be truly good for the world there's always something whether it's a footprint a carbon footprint whether it's uh, in pharma the high prices i mean how can you look a patient in the eye i mean consumer staples yeah they need their resources from land they're, they're they're chopping trees in the amazon i mean there are many many companies so like that so it's really hard to be ethical in it but that might be a topic for a whole show by itself yes yeah, interesting points and i think that's something we should definitely discuss later we could we could um, definitely talk a lot about that then uh, maybe the next question came from just David, just dividends, but also Tony uh, from One Million Journey had a really high interest in this. So, with big oil preparing to enter and expand their business into renewable energy, do you expect the lines between the energy and the u utility sector to blur? What's your long-term outlook on the energy sector? It's a really, really good question, isn't it? And and I suppose Shell. I've analyzed recently are, are probably key in this pivoting into this kind of, of sector I'm all for it I mean we, we know the demands for oil will will drop dramatically if we, if we don't get planes back in the sky anytime soon the demand for oil is, is not going to rise we, we should probably plan 
in for the energy sector in around this what 40 50 dollar barrel mark but i uh, will they blow I, I don't know it's really hard it's really hard to know i'm interested to see how how xom and, and cvs what, what their plans are and what they are planning to do in that space are they going to pivot to renewable i think it makes sense i mean you look at electric vehicles you, you know, smart grids everything is going towards electrification I, I think it makes sense to pivot at least part of your business that way i would prefer to see all them companies do that but i, I just don't know um but it's a good question my outlook on the energy sector we're always going to need energy the prices now might be too high the barrel is low but we're still going to need oil we're still going to need energy so there's there's going to be a market there somewhere but just who to invest in right now is is something i'm unsure on no so i i, I won't i will give a short answer i think the oil industry is it's not just the oil price being down because of let's say um, less oil demand we should not forget that the shale industry and the boom and the innovation there broke the cartel the opec because america is now self-sufficient so they can pump whatever they want second to that yes i do believe that it will become more like utility industry if you look at the technology that they are looking at for renewable en energies what i what i'm most concerned about is that it becomes a low margin industry because in the in the current business you just work with i don't know Nigeria or something like that and you have got kind of a monopoly to take all the resources out of the ground there and but now you get you get it for free at sun yeah as an example it's water so I think it will be much lower margin business and I think actually that uh, it becomes more like a utility in in such cases and unless there is some innovation that that we cannot foresee now at the moment so my long-term energy uh, outlook on the energy sector, I don't know. I paused my investments in energy like oil. It's half of my uh, target uh, desired allocation. It's good enough. I'll keep chugging the dividends, but I'm not doing more until I see it playing out. I do think that if you buy some shell now as a starting investor, put it for five years on the shelf, I think you will do well, at least already with the dividends collected. <laughs> Okay, um, Rep Stones was the next question, and he asked, worried about tea? No, it's a really small position in my portfolio. I know why he asked this, because I, I said today on Twitter, tea under 28 is the new under 30, because a few months ago it was every time, oh, if it dips under 30, you need to buy it. And it was actually quite quiet lately on Twitter. I felt like, where are those people? Did they finish all their buying, or did they get a bit nervous? I don't know. I'm not worried about it. I, I I just bought bought tea as a as a yield play, really small, to my portfolio, and and that's what it is for me. So I'm not I'm not worried about it. I think tea itself should be worried. I don't think their acquisitions were really well uh, thought through, and if I see now what Disney is doing, and if they, for instance, get also ESPN on the um, how you say it on 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 the streaming, poof. Yeah, and, and and I'm I'm not so bullish on 5G. So I think T in general should be worried, but I think the price is right for the the risk is priced then. Yeah, we, we mentioned that before about the, the Twitter gurus, so to speak, and, and T was constantly constantly on our on our news feeds and it was a bit worrying worrisome that investors are coming on just throwing money in this because it dips under 30. And I actually seen someone their strategy was to to buy loads when it dropped below 30 and then sell the same <laughs> amount so and then they keep whatever the difference in shares was and i mean what what do you do now when it drops to 28 do you i i, I don't know but like qt is, is going to be a small position in, in my portfolio I'm not overly worried and collecting collecting the dividend and they, they should be fine nice so the last question then from mdc2 the hero or trading 212 so it's so, about brokerage accounts for the, for the listeners that don't know what this means. If you asked me this two weeks ago, I would have probably said the Giro. But then you mentioned last week that Trading 212 have this cool feature called Poise where you can actually create yeah. your own ETF. You can set up an auto investment on it. 
at the same time every month and just pay into that. So I've set that up this week. I've picked all my 32 companies that, that I currently want at the moment. I can split them up by percentage according to my tiers, 5% in top tier, 4%, 3%, 2%, and set my order investment every month that it just comes out of my account so I do not have to even log into my account. I think that's brilliant. That's amazing. So yeah. that feature alone for me, and it's, it's so easy to use. They probably don't have the range of, I suppose they're, they're, they're traditionally what a CFD account. So yeah. this is kind of the new side one, but for what I need a farm, I'm, I'm quite happy. Um, so I'm going to side with trading 212 for now. This is so funny that you say it because I think it was Dividend Wave that shared me such an affiliate link. I said, okay, let's give it a try. Yeah, because of course I'm 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 a bit suspicious on the hero, although I don't know if trading 212 is any better, but I opened an account on Monday, I believe. And I started to play with the pie charts. I put the Noble 30 in there. I think I could get 26 or 25 companies. So few are missing. So I need to request trading to 212 to add them. But I also put my whole 40 portfolio in there. And I got them all in there. So I've got now the pie charts. I didn't do anything with it yet. I'm just playing a little bit with the app. With the app but I'm really, really impressed by the pie chart feature. It's it works so easily and so nice and to your point auto invest and and it's so if i go for the user friendliness and the functionality at the moment without having used and really invested it but just by first impressions i would go for trading 212 if if i wouldn't know the hero yet um i have not invested money yet i might put a few hundred euros on it just to test out the app but I first want to do my due diligence about how the company is structured because that's the reason why I'm looking elsewhere from the hero because I don't trust the management anymore at the hero. And trading 212 is hot and upcoming. I don't know if these are a bunch of cowboys or whether there's a really a proper structure behind it. So I want to do more research first before I answer this question yeah they, they are regulated in the uk so they do have some some regulation behind them so i'm sure they're legit to a, a certain degree but but you're, you're right you should definitely look a little bit deeper it, it was somebody actually that listens to the podcast um highlighted the gyro to me and i meant I, I i mentioned on the european financial independence podcast that i'm with the, the gyro and they offer the 100k guarantee and what I later found out was that guarantee is only covered on your cash balance and not on the mm -hmm. actual exactly. shares that you hold. And the shares that you hold is only guaranteed up to 20K. And that's a big difference because if you have over 20K in shares, you're at risk. And are you holding those shares at the moment when they loan them out? So yeah. they guarantee that again via the other investment vehicle. But this yeah. is where it becomes too shady. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and for me, I, I, I started a, a, a Twitter feed on it and you got some feedback. But for me, it was a bit of an eye opener. And I've never, I suppose my due, due diligence never looked that far into companies like that, but I was a little bit shocked. And for me, I'd rather pay a little bit more in fees and have safe account mm -hmm. than, than not have a safe account. So trading 212, I'm going to play around with that. I'm, I'm considering opening up some some Irish brokers that have been around for, for a long time. The fees are ridiculous, but but your money's guaranteed up, up to that 100,000. So that's what I'm kind of considering at the moment. Cool. So no clear answer for him, but I think uh, we're both leaning towards trading 212 based on first impressions. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. With that, and I think um, um, we're almost coming to the end of the show, but we still have one section to go, and those are the stock picks. EMF, what's your stock pick, stock pick for the week? So I, I really struggled with the stock pick this week. There was nothing really jumped out at me this week. So I opted for Verizon. Really just just on, on what we mentioned earlier about, about T and, and T being so popular on Twitter and everyone, are you worried about T or talking about T? Verizon is, is a similar company. They have a similar growth rate. They have a lot less debt, a lot less debt. Um, and they're in a similar position to, to T. So I would look to them maybe as an alternative. 
Um, I haven't valued him or anything like that, but but just looking at at some of the quick stats, they've, they've got a four percent yield. The well covered free cash flow, I think it's under fifty percent, and the four PE is is twelve dot one three. So, I mean, they look decent. If if you if you like tea and you like you want a little bit of diversification in that industry, I definitely check them out. Have you got a stock pick this week? So, like you, uh, not too many, because although people were often on Twitter saying like, "Oh, the stock market is down, down, down." for me everything still looks expensive but i can tell you where i've put my money yet because that's maybe the best one uh, best uh, indicator i i sold last week uh, one put option for with expiration of october mid october i believe in johnson johnson at 135 at that moment it was spot a three percent yield it's now around i think 143 144 dollars so nine dollars above that so let it still go down what is it six seven percent and then i'll be a buyer so i buy johnson and johnson around three percent yield if it dips there so that's my stock pick for the week i don't know if it will get there this week but you can consider me a buyer around that price i can tell you it won't get there this week because it's friday and the markets are closed the <laughs> someone is awake. <laughs> so that takes us to the end of the show. Um, it's quite fun for me to do that this this week. Um, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it. Do you like us actually talking about stocks and analyze them? If you do, what stocks would you like us to analyze? We'd be happy to go through them. Any questions or feedback is is, is greatly appreciated. And and as always, thanks for listening. And thanks to ED Joy for spending his Friday nights with me. It's quite late here, so thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Everyone, have a good weekend ahead and a good week, and speak to you next time again.